The jobs engine continues, Tesla falters, and Bob Iger gets his way at Disney. This is Bloomberg Wall Street Week. I'm David Weston. But we start with investing legend Ray Dalio, who has been on Wall Street Week several times through the years, but perhaps never more memorably than back in 1982 in the wake of the Mexican sovereign debt default, when Ray both appeared before Congress and on this program with Marty Zweig and Louis Rukeyser to take a pretty firm position on where things were headed. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Mitchell, it's a great pleasure and a great honor to be able to appear before you in examination with what is going wrong with our economy. The economy is now flat, teetering on the brink of failure. You were recently quoted in an article. You said, I can say this with absolute certainty because I know how markets work. I can say with absolute certainty that if you look at the liquidity base in the corporations and the world as a whole, that there's such a reduced level of liquidity that you can't return to an era of stagflation. And we welcome now Ray Dalio of Bridgewater back to Wall Street Week. So, Ray, great to have you back on. It's great to see you somewhat younger back in 1982. <laughs> but take us back to 1982, because you've talked about that since as being a really transformative, a pivotal moment in your life. Tell us about what happened and what happened afterwards. Like, watch me. Was I arrogant? <laughs> like, I, I look at myself now, I couldn't have been more arrogant. And I couldn't have been more wrong and painfully wrong. And so that's why it was a transitional moment for me. Uh, because uh, <clears throat> I got so broke that my dad had to lend me $4,000 to pay for my family bills. So that was my bottom, my big bottom. And that painful experience made me think, how do I get all the upside without the downside of risk. Okay, so it's the big question that all investors have to deal with. The amount the, uh, being knocked out and the bet that you can lose that can take you out is is your risk, but how do you get the great upside? And so then I had to engineer it and uh, I learned about diversification. I learned that if I can have 15 uncorrelated bets I can eliminate 80% of my risk without producing my return. Everybody looking at this says, look, look at what Bridgewater ended up and the extraordinary success you just went through. So uh, go back to 1982. Uh, you said you should have been more diversified uh, and you should have had some other points of view. What is it you got wrong in 1982 exactly? What was your mistake? And could there have been somebody come along to say, at that moment, wait a second, Ray, you should think about that. You haven't thought about that over there. Yes. So. Um, I had calculated that Mexico, I, that uh, American banks had lent more money to foreign countries than they were going to be able to pay back. And that was going to be a debt default. Which was true. Which was true. Mexico defaulted and all these countries afterwards uh, defaulted. And I said that that debt crisis was going to cause a crisis all the way uh, th around the world because it goes to banks and so on. And I didn't realize the mechanics of how the changing of a debt squeeze, having a debt squeeze in those countries so money would not go to those countries, used to go to those countries in lending. And while they were having a squeeze, we could have a disinflationary boom. Mm -hmm. And it produced the 80s. My point is that these experiences in life, if you go back and you study history and you see how history repeats, Many things never happened in your lifetime before. You built up Bridgewater at the same time having studied history. Now, I'm surmising you knew you got to think about succession at some point. You can't stay forever. Now, tell us how that's worked and has it succeeded? Are you satisfied with that succession at Bridgewater? Oh, it's, so, it's been so great. So I, um, so I did that and I had that track record with them, bringing them in as you described. And, um, and Bob Prince, Greg Jensen, near other people, all of those people are all part of that mission. And there was also part of a culture of can we be radical, truthful, and radically transparent? Could we trust each other? Could we go through all of that? And, and so that was all the arc. And then, of course, you, have to, you know you want to pass it along. And so then um, I, um, with a lot of planning and with the comfort 
that these great people I've worked with and I know and those great people working together can continue to pick up where I left off or we left off together and then go bring it to a higher level beyond me. And so that's the success. And so um, in you know, about 18 months, they, I turned it over to them. They have their, uh, it's theirs. And now I'm a mentor. And as a mentor, I, we, we have the enjoyment, the great pleasure of being able to brainstorm that way, but it's theirs they, and they own it. And so when they have, I'm confident that they have the qualities and the terrific elements to be able to bring them up to um, have theirs that will be hopefully better than uh, ours. Because, wow, I think we had an amazing success and the success, it's like raising your kids, mm -hmm. you know, the, the joy that the ones who are older feel about the next generation and seeing them succeed. That'll be my mark of, of my success. If they succeed, it's my success. If, I, if they don't succeed, it's my failure. But I, I, I couldn't have a better group of people and a um, greater simpatico <laughs> in terms of that element of you know, where we're going on the same basic approaches mm -hmm. and the same basic um, culture. I am delighted to say Ray Dalio will be staying with us as we apply the lessons he has learned the hard way to what investors face right now in 2024. This is Wall Street Week on Bloomberg. This is Wall Street Week. I'm David Weston, Ray Dalio of Bridgewater and author of at least Principles and the Changing World Order, as well as a great deal more, has stayed with us. So, Ray, let's take what we talked about, those hard-learned lessons that you had going back to 1982, even 71, uh, and apply them to today. You've written a recent post about a pivotal year on the brink, 2024. Take us through your analysis there. There were many things that surprised me in my life that wouldn't have surprised me if I had studied the history, because they didn't happen in my lifetime, but they happened many times before. So I created a need, really, to when certain things are coming along that I'm not used to seeing, to then go back. And there are five things that are now the big forces that interact together. The way those five forces interact with each other through history has a pattern to it, and you know those interactions. So when we look at that pattern of what's now happening, and we could look ahead with that in mind, we can see that two, two, uh, 2024 is a, um, we are on the brink of a number of things related to that. I can li list those things, but we're on the brink, and it becomes also somewhat of a definitive year because of we're gonna find out how we are with each other politically and we're going to find out geopolitically a lot. A definitive year, but not the only one. Neil Ferguson of the Hoover Institution, for example, says that 2024 stands out compared with the last 30 or 40 years, but not compared to some of what came before. If you go back maybe to the 1990s, yeah, uh, that period seemed uh, pretty low risk. The Soviet Union had collapsed. And apart from uh, trouble in the Balkans, uh, with the breakup of Yugoslavia and uh, some other trouble spots like Somalia, the world by the standards of the rest of the 20th century was pretty peaceful. But if you go back 50 years, uh, imagine we're back in 1974, uh, that was a much more dangerous time than we're living through now. And I speak with uh, some insight as I'm in the midst of writing about that period as I write the second volume of my biography of Henry Kissinger. So we, we have a tendency to judge the present by comparison with the recent past. But the recent past was an interwar period, the period between two Cold Wars. Cold War I ended with the Soviet collapse. And we didn't really notice Cold War II beginning, but I think it really began when Xi Jinping came to power in China. Geopolitical risk is not the only factor that may make 2024 pivotal. We also have elections around the world, and particularly in the United States, which raises uncertainty over economic policies, which Neil Ferguson thinks markets are well equipped to handle. I think we know that markets try to uh, adjust for domestic political risk. We, we know this because there's been some great work done 
uh, in recent years on the way that in an election year, uh, investors have a tendency to make some allowance for policy uncertainty. And the bigger the difference between the candidates in the United States, the more uncertainty. And we've certainly got uh, a pretty big difference uh, this year, but it's the same difference that we had back in 2020 between uh, Donald Trump and, and Joe Biden. But Ray Dalio is concerned that the election this year may go past the policy uncertainty investors have dealt with in the past, that given the disagreements, even violent disagreements over the last election, we may face more fundamental uncertainties about the underlying political system. And you in your writings have specifically focused on that second force is maybe the most dominant right now going to 2024, the potential for internal conflict. I mean, you even write the possible uh, there's as high of a 50-50 chance of civil war you talk about. Uh, is that right, 50-50? Well, um, so let me define the civil war, uh, uh, that you have a situation where you have irreconcilable no. differences so that there becomes um, a failure to follow the rules. In other words, let's take January 6th incident, OK? You could see a situation in which you don't accept losing, don't accept the results. We are getting more and more, not only just in the election, but even in decision making, as the state of Texas deals with the federal government on issues, or we had sanctuary city issues, where there may not be the agreeing on that. These irreconcilable differences, irreconcilable differences, for example, on children and sexuality and education, how should that be? These are not compromisable issues. That greater and greater extremism is an issue. And so when we come to, let's say, this election period, how will we get through that and how will we work together in an effective way? Or will it be even so chaotic and, and that we keep that we start fighting with each other. So when I say we're on the brink, I think that it's safe to say or accurate to say that some of these questions um, exist and we will find out in a year, OK, how well we can be together and that well, how well we would be together, not only the conflict, but how effective can we be? We're going to find that out over the next year. What we need, I think, is a strong middle. We have to be do this together with a strong middle and a bipartisan. In my opinion, almost uh, the president of the United States should have a bipartisan cabinet. In other words, draw the best and bring it together so that there's a bipartisanship, so we're not going to harm each other. And then uh, almost do a Manhattan Project-like uh, convention of thinking about how we do an engineering so that we raise productivity levels and, in a broad-based way and that we create um, equal opportunity and strive for equal opportunity. I think we need to have that sort of thing because those, that polarity that has to do with wealth also has to do, and values, is something that threatens our system. Once again, Neil Ferguson is more hopeful that we can avoid the worst of the turmoil we experienced in 2020, that the Constitution is constructed to deal with what we're seeing and will once again stand us in good stead. I am not as pessimistic as those who think if Donald Trump is re-elected, it's the end of the republic, it's the end of the Constitution, because the founders designed the Constitution very brilliantly with the notion in mind that somebody like Donald Trump might very well become president one day. You can see it in the Federalist Papers. You can see Alexander Hamilton, for example, and James Madison thought that this would likely happen because they too studied history, they too applied history, and they saw that most republics came unstuck because a demagogue would become president. And so the, the Constitution is really well designed to make it hard for somebody who doesn't respect it uh, to overthrow it. However the United States comes out of the election this year, we will have to confront the large and growing deficit, which will mean breaking the pattern of simply amassing ever greater debt. There are two constraints to debt. No, you can't get deeper and deeper and deeper in debt um, and spend without consequences, because when you borrow, you have to pay back. And then the question is, do you pay back in hard money or do you pay back in printed cheaper money? So what you see um, are th these two factors. First is the debt service squeezing um, expenditures because as debt rises and interest rates rise, 
debt service as a percentage of your spending rises, and that squeezes out other types of spending. So that's a mechanical thing, and it works that way. And it, we're, we, we can see it happening as we project over the next you know, five and 10 years, uh, uh, it becomes more and more apparent. I won't get into all that, but the second is that as that becomes more apparent, um, and the, uh, then the, you have a situation where holders of the debt may not want to hold the debt because one man's debts are another man's assets. And so if they are holding at debt assets that either they feel cannot be well paid back or will be monetized, you don't want to uh, hold that. In addition to the economic cycle, external conflict, and internal conflict, Ray Dalio focuses on the potential of technology, not just to disrupt, but to address some of the challenges we face. Man's inventiveness and new technologies that they create is, a, is the fifth force. And that force is now more powerful than it has really uh, been before. It's a new um, industrial age. But even the promise of technology takes us back to the geopolitical risk Ray Dalio is concerned about, particularly as Neil Ferguson points out, given the central role of Taiwan in the production of the chips needed for AI. The economic implications of what would be the, the Taiwan semiconductor crisis would be much, much larger than the economic implications of the Cuban Missile Crisis in 1962. Now, that was a very dangerous moment in Cold War I because it was the closest we came to World War III. But what does Cuba export? That's right, David, cigars. Now, some people like cigars, but economically, they're much less important than high-end semiconductors are today. So this would be a kind of Cuban Missile Crisis with huge geopolitical risk, but also with huge geoeconomic risk. Even before a shot was fired, the news that there was a Taiwan crisis would cause, I think, major economic uh, disruption. You're famous for talking in long-term cycles and short-term cycles. And they're very powerful, and as you say, you're based on, in the changing world order, you go back hundreds of years to show where the patterns are over time. What is the role of the individual decision maker in that world? I mean, we spend a lot of time here at Bloomberg, for example, focused on the chair of the Federal Reserve. What Jay Powell thinks, what he, uh, where he goes to lunch, you know, what, he, what he's saying at any given moment. Uh, how much difference can Jay Powell make given that long-term cycle that, that history almost foreordains? You always have to view the individual within the context of the circumstances they face. A different type of individual is required for different types of circumstances in history. And you always have to look at the long term versus the short term. Because over the short term, you're going to have these big swings and so on. But over the longer term, if a swing goes too far in one direction, there's going to be the necessity, the compelling, obvious necessity to go in the other direction. So a good example would be um, um, giving away money free when you had a negative real interest rate for bonds of 1.7% and no interest, so free, no interest, mm -hmm. at the same time as you had principal-only loans so, uh, so, uh, so that you didn't have to pay principals back, principal payments, you basically had free money, created a, an excessive bubble that then created the basis of the next cycle, right? And then to tightening a monetary policy. Ray, understanding everything that you do about the mechanics, as you put it, of financial markets as well as debt and the way the economy really works. Uh, go back to 1982. If you had it to do over again, would you rather be Ray Dalio starting out in 1982 or Ray Dalio is starting out in 2024? Oh, 82, before 82. I think life, this is life. Life is a journey in which you really don't know anything. You have intrinsic your nature and you have your pull to something and you go after it. And then it's the power of mistakes and learning from mistakes. I have um, a principle, pain plus reflection equals progress. It's like a video game. You have your goals, and then you make your mistakes, and then you figure you have your learning, and it gives you learning points, and then you keep going on that. That journey, including the mistakes, 
would be, is so much better than to have the, ah, I got it right, I know everything right, and there's no such adventure, no such journey? No, I'd much rather have start out and have that journey. Ray, it's been such a pleasure having you here. Thank you so much for doing this. Oh, thank you for having me. Many thanks to Ray Dalio of Bridgewater. Coming up, we go to Argentina and hear from President Millet about his economic plans. That's next on Wall Street Week on Bloomberg. This is Wall Street Week. I'm David Weston. After years of economic struggles, Argentina's new president, Javier Millet, is administering shock therapy that he promised when he campaigned for his job. Bloomberg International Policy and Economics correspondent Michael McKee lays out the issues for us. Argentina has long been a symbol of economic mismanagement. A legacy of government overspending has led to recurring bouts of high inflation and debt defaults. Javier Mille came to office in December promising a radical transformation. His plans include massively slashing government spending, privatizing state-owned businesses, eliminating the central bank, and most controversially, replacing the Argentine peso with the U.S. dollar. The dollar would, he said, solve the inflation problem because the government couldn't spend more dollars than it has. But Argentina doesn't have enough dollars in its foreign exchange holdings to make it work right now. Adopting it would lead to a deep recession and tie Argentina's economy to the Federal Reserve. While a recession may indeed be in the cards, Miley's plans aren't working out as he'd hoped. The opposition-controlled Argentine legislature has blocked many of the changes he wants to make. Inflation remains over 20 percent a month or almost 300 percent a year. So while Miley cut the peso's value in half, dollarization has been put on hold. The Miele plan did convince the International Monetary Fund to offer $4.7 billion in loans to pay its foreign exchange debts, and the stock market is up 20 percent since he took office. Whether Miele's plans can succeed will depend on keeping that optimism going, getting the economy going, and bringing down inflation, enough to build up dollar reserves. He says he's not giving up on dollarization, but insists his program needs time until the money stops rolling out in all directions. David? This week, our editor-in-chief, John Micklethwaite, traveled to Buenos Aires for an in-depth interview with President Millet about what he hopes to accomplish. So first, you need to reform the financial system, which is what we are working on. And in that context, it's not just that the exchange rate is flexible, but also the money amount never varies. And as the economy recovers and grows and the money demand increases, as the amount of pesos will already be given, endogenously will have a dollarization process relating to the monetization performed by individuals in the economy. What, and I know that you are doing this thing with the floating exchange rate where you've been deprecating or depreciating the official rate by 2% each month. And the IMF and various people have said, you know, you must speed up, you must go quicker. Um, will you proceed? I know you are doing these other things, but will you speed up um, that rate of depreciation? No, because it makes no sense. It makes no sense to do that. That was Argentine President Millet speaking with Bloomberg Editor-in-Chief John Micklethwaite. Coming up, our special contributor Larry Summers takes us through the U.S. jobs numbers out on Friday. This was a hot report that suggested that, if anything, the economy is re-accelerating. That's next on Wall Street Week on Bloomberg. This is Wall Street Week. I'm David Weston, and we're joined once again by our very special contributor here on Wall Street Week. He is Larry Summers of Harvard. So, Larry, welcome back. Great to have you here, particularly this week when we got those jobs numbers, which surprised the upside. What did you make of them? This was a hot report. Jobs above 300,000, upwards revision, strong household survey, hours uh, up, payrolls up at nearly a 10 percent annualized uh, rate. This was a hot report that suggested that, if anything, 
the economy is re-accelerating. Uh, this is very different from what lots of people, most people, I think, were uh, expecting and fits the thesis that the neutral rate is much higher than people supposed and tight money is much less potent than uh, people supposed. So let's talk about the neutral rate. You've said before that the Fed should have at least some idea of the neutral rate to know whether it's restrictive or not. We heard from Chair Powell this week, speaking at Stanford, where he said, yes, we are restrictive in our policy, and yet he quite explicitly said he doesn't need to worry about where the neutral rate is for policy going forward. So all those are very important things, but they're not things that affect the longer run potential output of the United States. So uh, honestly, though, so the, the question of what will be the, the uh, you know, equilibrium interest rate, the, the neutral interest rate going forward, doesn't really matter for policy today. Saying we don't need to know what the neutral rate is it's like saying you should drive your car on feel without looking at the speedometer. It is just a mistake. You cannot know, and look, I don't know what uh, the chairman said in full context, and I want to be fair, but there's no way to judge what policy is without knowing what would be a neutral policy. My view is that the evidence is overwhelming, that the neutral rate is far higher than the 2.5%, 2.6% that the Fed talks about. That evidence comes from four places. First, we have high interest rates, and we have an economy that is, if anything, growing faster than its long-run uh, potential creating jobs as fast or faster than natural growth in the labor force, even allowing for immigration. Second, we have an economy with financial conditions that are extremely loose, that are actually looser than they were before the Fed started the whole tightening process. If you look at credit spreads, you look at the stock market, suggesting that in the fullness of it all, financial conditions actually haven't been tightened in an appreciable way. Third, if you look at the market's estimate of the long-run neutral rate as formed by looking at longer-term uh, forward uh, interest rates, that neutral rate is comfortably above uh, 4%. Fourth, if you look at the fundamental determinants of the neutral rate, we have big surges in uh, budget deficits that, if anything, look to get worse uh, given the political process. We have big changes in resilience investment, in green investment, in new investment, in uh, data centers, along with deglobalization which may limit capital inflows uh, into our country. So whether you look at the fundamentals, you look at market estimates, you look at financial conditions, or you look at the current strength of the economy, it seems to me the evidence is overwhelming that the neutral rate is far higher than the Fed supposes. And so cutting uh, rates and hitting the accelerator in an economy creating jobs at more at a pace of more than three million jobs uh, a year, with payrolls growing at rates consistent with inflation far above uh, two percent, with a need to hoard ammunition because we're not a hundred percent certain we're past uh, the every financial problem in. Uh, the banking uh, system, and with potential supply shocks coming down uh, the road, things could change. Things are always subject to rapid change, so I don't want to make a prescription for monetary policy in June, but on current facts and uh, current trends, I think it would be an inappropriate act to cut rates uh, in June, and it is deeply troubling to me 
that the Fed somehow thinks that fidelity to its previous forward guidance and doctrine it believed some time ago is a more important thing than trying to gauge the neutral rate on an ongoing uh, basis. There's a lot of talk right now about what we're seeing in the labor market here actually is an increase in immigration. And I'm not necessarily even talking about the people coming across the southern border illegally. I'm talking about legal immigration, which has increased rather significantly under the Biden administration. How is that affecting your model for economic growth in the United States? Look, that, that has meant uh, more labor force uh, growth, which has meant more supply. To the extent that those immigrants are earning and increasing the capacity of the economy and remitting the money ba back to their families where they came from, it's a supply increase without a concomitant demand increase. And therefore, it's deflationary. But that's what's been baked in and is going to happen and has been happening. And so the question for movements in inflation is, is that trend going to accelerate or is it going to decelerate over time? As I look at the attitude, which I find ugly and unattractive, of a potential Trump administration towards immigration, if I look at the political pressures on the Biden administration, it seems to me much more likely that immigration uh, flows are going to decrease going forward than that they're going to increase going forward. And that's just one of the ways in which deglobalization may contribute to higher inflation. Well, Larry, one of the things you're known for is the peripheral vision. The other things you're looking at that may be worrying you, what other things are worrying you that are out there right now? David, I'm nervous about oil prices, given what's happening in the Middle East and given the increased possibility that Iran is going to be drawn into this uh, conflict, given that we've got the coming of summer combined with higher wholesale prices projected. I think there's a real shot that we will have gasoline prices back to having a forehandle. And I think the last thing is that if I'm right, I'm not convinced that duration mismatches in the banking system have been fully addressed. And the combination of duration uh, mismatches plus hot money on uh, the depositor uh, side plus problems in commercial real estate means that we could have some real financial uh, distress at some point. Again, I think it's odds off, but it's a risk. And that's another reason why I think the Fed should be hoarding its ammunition, not uh, pumping up uh, bubbles with easy money at a time of rapid growth and epically loose financial conditions. Uh, Larry, the Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen is in China this week uh, talking to them about trade issues. There's a lot of concern about what people, I think the Wall Street Journal may have co coined it actually, the sh China shock 2.0 because China's built up an awful lot of capacity through a lot of subsidies, and there's a concern about really flooding the markets with really cheap goods. How could that affect the global economy and the U.S. economy? We've talked about this before, David. Uh, secular stagnation has crossed the Pacific, and China has a chronic excess of savings over investment, and they have to do something about that. The right way for them to have dealt with it was to have stimulated domestic uh, spending. But that does not fit, and particularly domestic household consumption, which is long suppressed in China. But that doesn't fit with uh, Chairman Xi's ideological predilections. And so it looks like they're trying to do it by building manufacturing uh, capacity. That runs the risk of everything glut driven by 
Chinese uh, subsidies. And I think that runs the risk of reawakening very substantial uh, economic tensions between uh, China and uh, the rest of the world. What they focus on in China is that this is all smaller in terms of a trade surplus relative to the Chinese economy than it was at the time of the first China shock during the, during the decade of the noughts. What that misses is that the Chinese economy is much larger relative to the global economy than it was 15 years ago. And so a given shock to the Chinese economy is potentially much bigger for uh, the global economy. So I think this is likely to be uh, substantially disruptive. My guess is that we're going to see considerably more protection than most people are looking for. And for the medium term, I don't think that's going to be good for the inflation outlook or good uh, for efficiency of production in the global economy, or good for uh, harmony uh, among uh, nations. And the reports coming out about uh, China cyber uh, challenges, deep fakes, intrusions into our data systems, uh, hacking are uh, troubling. And I don't want to rush to judgment because I don't know exactly what uh, the facts, uh, what, the, what the facts are. But uh, as I've said to my Chinese friends, um, as someone who in general has worked to promote comedy, who thinks that truculence is an attitude not a strategy for uh, the United States. The Chinese often seem like they're doing their very best to make it uh, maximally difficult to support uh, comedy and to reject Cold War type mentalities. Larry, thank you so much for being here. That's Larry Summers of Harvard, our very special contributor here on Wall Street Week. Coming up, we welcome back Sanal Desai of Franklin Templeton to take us through the week in the markets. That's next on Wall Street Week on Bloomberg. This is Wall Street Week. I'm David Weston. Equity markets surged on Friday after those strong jobs numbers, but for the week overall, the S&P 500 was down by just under 1%, ending at 5204. That is still, though, 100 points over the median estimate of our Bloomberg elves. The Nasdaq was off eight tenths of a percent. Bonds sold off throughout the week, with the yield on the 10-year up 20 basis points, tended 4.4 percent. To take us through this week in the markets, we welcome back now Sanal Desai, Franklin Templeton, CIO for Fixed Income. So, Sanal, great to have you back with us. So, what should an investor take away from this week in the markets? Well, you know, it's a part of what investors need to take away is it's going to stay volatile for a while longer, and that's really clear. I think bond markets have started absorbing the fact that the Fed doesn't need to rush in cutting rates. That's also quite clear. Having said all of this, next week we might get good inflation prints and you might get a 15 basis point rally. The problem, is, as I see it, is that the Fed has been very clear, Jay Powell has been really clear that he would like to be able to cut. <laughs> I think if he had been in a position to cut already, he would have cut. The data has not cooperated. And so essentially, the, the, there is a little bit of uh, whipsaw action happening right now in, uh, in the bond market, certainly. And the equity market, no comment. <laughs> I have no comment <laughs> yeah, just, as to what's going on there yeah, at all. Just off to the races. Well, as you say, whether you call it whipsaw or call it volatility, there's a lot of risks yeah. out there that are hard to quantify. We've spent a lot of the program actually talking about a variety of risks, not just economic, but also geopolitical and political. As an investor, when you put together a portfolio, how do you provide the sort of risks that we're seeing right now out there? So, you know, the reality is I couldn't agree more with your uh, earlier guests. We are, you know, any one of this series of risks 
China and Taiwan, uh, Russia, Ukraine, the Middle East, and the American elections, of course, and the other elections we're going to see around the world, any one of these would have actually been somewhat significant. All of them together, of course, increases in in terms of the uncertainty. It increases, it, it increases the potential impact, no doubt. The problem is you can't actually manage your portfolio to one of these risks because how do you actually handicap any one of these as being likely you, you just if anything disastrous happened in the Middle East or with Russia or with China, clearly what you'd want to be in is completely uh, only entirely safe. Maybe you'd want gold. I don't know. Dude, that's not how you manage your portfolio, mm -hmm. right? So I think for us, what we've done, you know, uh, David, we we were very short for a long time with US Treasuries. We've moved to a neutral position. And we are hesitant, I'd, I'd say, to go overly long despite 10 years being where they are right now, in part because the economy is pretty strong. And I'm not sure that the Fed's going to be able to cut as quickly as they would like to cut. So I would tend to agree entirely with Larry. I've been saying September now for a while as being the right time for the Fed to start thinking about this. I also think that the overall number of cuts is not going to be quite as high as markets would like, leading us to that neutral rate of about 4%. Mm -hmm. So. so what does it tell us about duration? I mean, you have cash on the one extreme, you have longer duration on the other. Where do you go? Are you moving toward more durations now? So, you know, what I'd say is what I would advise people to do, you know, cash has worked incredibly well. How can, how can, we, how can we deny it? You know, it's, it's paying really well. However, it is important to start thinking about increasing that duration. It's not to get massive returns in fixed income. That's not what I'm calling for. We, we are neutral. I'm talking about moving from overnight and cash towards ultra short and then slowly dipping into low duration and beginning to move out on that duration spectrum. But the Fed will cut. The one thing I would say, though, is this is not a series of cuts leading to a multi-year rally in yields. I think we are in a different place. If you look at where the fiscal deficit is, you look mm -hmm. at the fact that inflation right. is stickier than any, any of us would like. Right. Wages are pretty sticky. You've yeah. got to accept that fixed income is not going to give you equity-like returns. Yeah. Sanal, it's so great always to have you with us. Thank you. That's Sanal Desai of Franklin Templeton. Coming up, if rules are meant to be broken, why is everyone getting in so much trouble for breaking them? This is Wall Street Week on Bloomberg. Finally, one more thought. Rules are mostly made to be broken and are too often for the lazy to hide behind. So said General Douglas MacArthur during the Korean War when he was disobeying a direct order from President Truman. He broke the rules and the president promptly sacked him. There are times when all of us have to make tough decisions about following the rules. I got crosswise of a trial judge very early in my career when I deliberately ignored his instruction not to move a controversial document into evidence. It was the only way to make a record for appeal and so I did it anyway. I remember Judge Barnes, his name was, leaning over the bench, raising his voice, and reaming me out for what seemed like forever. On the way out of the courtroom, a senior litigation partner from another law firm put his arm around my shoulders and said, you don't win cases by making friends of judges. And I certainly didn't. The business world is full of examples of people either breaking the rules or coming so close that there's nowhere for them to hide. Elon Musk notoriously kept tweeting about Tesla, which got him in trouble with the SEC. All of these allegations are very pointed. Uh, they're very direct in alleging that he committed, uh, uh, you know, actions that at least the SEC uh, feels were um, uh, against, uh, against regulations and potentially against the law. Apple has been accused of breaking the rules against anti-competitive behavior any number of times, most recently by the Attorney General of the United States. We allege that Apple has employed a strategy that relies on exclusionary, anti-competitive conduct that hurts both consumers and developers. For consumers, that has meant fewer choices, 
higher prices and fees, lower quality smartphones, apps and accessories, and less innovation from Apple and its competitors. And there are some so-called rules that we observe in the breach and may be happy doing it, like the Taylor Rule that pointed to much higher interest rates than any of us wanted. The Taylor Rule, for example, a, a guideline that central banks around the world uh, have used to guide uh, interest rate policy, would have suggested at the outset of this you needed short-term interest rates of 9 or 10 percent. We didn't get there. Sometimes it seems like General MacArthur had some of our political leaders in mind when he talked about breaking rules from a certain short-term congressman from Queens who simply made up his qualifications for the job. It's always, frankly, very sad when a public official that has, that is responsible for s properly stewarding the public trust betrays that trust. It is absolutely uh, imperative that George Santos resign from his seat. It is, it is extremely important for the integrity of this body. To a longtime New Jersey senator who stands accused of taking bribes. The senator and his wife accepted hundreds of thousands of dollars of bribes in exchange for Senator Menendez using his power and influence to protect and to enrich those businessmen and to benefit the government of Egypt. And then there's the arcane world of sports rules. We couldn't play these games if we didn't have rules to follow. But does the NFL really need a rule that ties performance payments at the end of the year to where a player was picked in the draft? San Francisco 49ers quarterback Brock Purdy probably doesn't think so. This week, we learned that he came out 24th on the bonus list because, as we all know, he was picked dead last his year, which meant that he already made about $50 million less last year than his counterpart in the Super Bowl, Patrick Mahomes. In the world of basketball, we certainly need rules about where we put that three-point line, which somehow got lost in the Portland, Oregon arena where several of the NCAA women's basketball games were played. Just before game time between Texas and North Carolina State, the coaches learned that the three-point line was closer to the basket at one end of the court than at the other. Faced with either playing the game with the wrong lines or postponing the game, the coaches decided to play on, with NC State winning to go on to the Final Four. It was a real embarrassment for the NCAA, but nothing like what it confronted three years ago when a player went on social media showing how pathetic the weight room provided to women athletes in the tournament was compared to their male counterparts. Where the men got an extensive facility with weight machines, squat racks, and benches, the women were given just a single stand of dumbbells, causing a public outrage, an NCAA apology, and promises of future parity for men and women. This year, women's basketball got a different sort of parody when Iowa Hawkeye guard Caitlin Clark passed the men's all-time scoring record. Maybe this time, the NCAA will learn its lesson about paying attention to the women's side of the tournament. Or, then again, it might just need another rule about that. That does it for this episode of Wall Street Week. I'm David West, and this is Bloomberg. See you next week.